KTNV TV, Las Vegas. This is News 13 Late, Southern Nevada's only late night hour of news. Good evening. Is the United States headed for war against the Soviet Union? It's an opinion shared by many, and in particular, an Army general on the National Security Council. General Robert Schweitzer said the Soviet Union is stronger in the area of land and sea-based missiles, as well as nuclear bombers, and they are preparing to strike. For his statement, Schweitzer was fired. President Reagan had this reaction from the White House this afternoon. Let me sum it up this way. I think this country uh, could have been on a road that could, might be described that way when we were unilaterally disarming and letting the margin of safety uh, disappear and the window of vulnerability get wider. And uh, that's why we're following the course we're following now. Schweitzer was fired from the Security Council for reportedly not clearing his speech beforehand. He's being rotated back to the Pentagon. Federal agents armed with search warrants swooped down on three Las Vegas firms today to break up one of the largest telephone boiler operations in the nation's history. Mark May was there and says that though no arrests were made, the evidence seized would be used for possible prosecution later. The investigation had been going on for the past two months. It was the largest undertaking of its kind by the post office in 10 years, involving 67 agents, many from out of state. Postal inspectors raided 50 states distributing company on Highland Drive, a telephone solicitation business which reportedly grossed more than $100 million a year. But 50 states was not the only company raided by the post office this morning. U.S. distributing here on Spring Mountain was also hit. A third business, H&S Specialties on Industrial Road, was also searched. The investigation began after complaints to the post office from the Gillette Corporation, the nation's largest manufacturer of razors, razor blades, disposable lighters, and ballpoint pens. The complaints basically all allege that there were numerous telephone solicitations made from the border room operations and allegedly selling products manufactured or distributed by Gillette. But the post office and U.S. Attorney Lamont Mills refused to comment on whether the items sent to buyers were counterfeit Gillette products or stolen goods, although one Gillette official said the company had no relationship whatsoever with 50 states distributing. A Postal Service truck pulled up to the loading dock at 50 states so authorities could confiscate mail, records, and other evidence. It will be turned over to a federal grand jury for possible indictments. Ironically, the post office stands to lose more than $1 million in lost revenue from products 50 states mailed annually. Mark May, News 13. The local FBI office announced tonight they have a federal warrant for the arrest of Frank Collada. Now, Metro has been looking for Collada for some time, and Collada is an alleged member of the infamous Hole in the Wall gang. The FBI also announced tonight the arrest of Lawrence Newman, who also is believed to have taken part in the July 4th break-in at Bertha's, along with other Hole in the Wall members. Bail has been set at $40,000 for Newman. Between Metro and the FBI, three of the six suspects are now in custody. New developments in the kidnapping case of Carrie Sag have surfaced. In addition to that, the man charged with the kidnapping is trying to prepare for his upcoming trial. Jackie Glass reports. At least for the time being accused kidnapper, Gerald Burgess is not going to go in alone in the courtroom. Burgess had been appointed a public defender but fired him and said he'd defend himself. But there was an attorney by his side today in court. Rick Abrams says he's been contacted about representing Burgess, but nothing's definite yet. In the meantime, Abrams told Judge Christensen today he'd appear at the next hearing on a motion to suppress prior convictions. The trial was set to go yesterday, but the judge put it off until January. Burgess said he needed more time, and and the state came in with some new information. Abrams I mean, feels uh, it may be exculpatory. The evidence. All I would, would state is that why did it take the state so long to uh, bring forth that evidence when they knew about it for, I would say, over a year. What prosecutors gave Burgess was a police report. Sources tell News 13 it contained information about a California inmate named Jesse Bishop, who told authorities he kidnapped and killed Carrie Sag and offered to take police to the burial site in northern Nevada. Bishop was investigated two years ago by the FBI and Metro, and then Metro detectives spoke to him again last week. Today, three investigators and Rex Bell from the district attorney's office went back to talk to Bishop. Before he left for Folsom Prison, Detective Jeff Dick said he was just following an old lead. We're going to uh, talk to him basically to find out uh, any information that he can give us. 
The detective wouldn't comment on Bishop's credibility, but said he seemed intelligent. Bishop is being held on a murder charge. Deputy Chief Eric Cooper says the timing of this renewed dialogue with Bishop and the Burgess trial is coincidental. Does Cooper expect results? We don't know exactly uh, what we're entering into. It could be a wild goose chase. It could be substantial. And uh, that's why we're sending our investigators up to find out once and for all. Jackie Glass, News 13. The Clark County Commission voted today against zoning for that proposed low-income housing project near Flamingo and Jones. Now, the vote kills the project, which pleased several hundred Spring Valley residents attending today's meeting to protest the project. Spring Valley residents packed City Hall. They came with their signs and maps to yell about a proposed 119 low-income housing project earmarked for a lot near Jones and Flamingo. The commission had to decide whether to continue the multiple family zoning on that lot. This woman told the commission she had had a bad experience with low-income housing before. The residents also argued that public transportation, schools, streets, and sewers in the area are inadequate now. The project, they said, would make matters even worse. And a representative of the school board reminded the commission that area schools are already overcrowded and there are no funds for new buildings. The kids, whether they're from this project or from moving into this area from any place, will have to be bused. But the housing authority director said the proposed site was perfect in every way. It's two-fifths of a mile from a medical center, only four-fifths of a mile from one shopping center and one mile each from two other shopping centers three-tenths of a mile from an elementary and a junior high school, three-tenths of a mile from the only boys club in the unincorporated area, two-fifths of a mile from a fire station. In the end, the commission voted to deny the zoning for the project, with only Commissioner Woodrow Wilson voting in favor of the zoning. The housing authority was disappointed and fears it may lose the $7.7 .7 million the federal government approved for the project. If the Housing Authority wants to appeal the County Commission decision, its only recourse would be to go through the courts. The next type of action has not yet been determined. The Housing Authority has to meet to discuss it. Lynn Mathis, News 13. Clark County teachers say they will hit the streets over the weekend collecting signatures needed on recall petitions for Board President Dr. James Lyman. As Deborah Campbell reports, the teachers' union threatened to recall Dr. Lyman and school board trustee Robert Forbes two months ago. It all began eight weeks ago when nearly 5,000 Clark County teachers gathered at the convention center to ratify a contract which itself stirred up a lot of controversy. The contract was unanimously accepted by the teachers, but at the same time the teachers union made it clear they wanted to get rid of the people they feel made it difficult to obtain the contract. Over the next few weeks, Superintendent Claude Perkins was virtually forced to resign. The union also added two school board members to their hit list, board president James Lyman and trustee Robert Forbes. This Friday, the teachers' union will go down to the elections department and file an intent to recall Dr. Lyman. He is still, um, I've called it a couple different terms, I think stubborn and obstinate, uh, stoic, uh, any other adjectives that I could, that he's not flexible, he's not bending, uh, and that he's viewing the school district uh, and in the running of the school district as the board is supposed to do, uh, that his role as the board president is one of it's my way or it doesn't happen. Well, that's a totally irresponsible statement by the union. Uh, stoic really isn't uh, uh, too derogatory. Uh, but I have never, never, uh, ever refused to listen to anyone at any time, any of my constituents or uh, anybody from the teachers or from the district. At this point, Bob Bovard, a CCCTA union official, is preparing the reasoning for recalling Dr. Lyman that will appear on the petition. Teachers will meet on Thursday and plan their strategy to gather the 7,000 signatures needed from Dr. Lyman's district. The union has 60 days from Friday to gather those signatures. The teachers' union says after they complete the recall drive against Dr. Lyman, trustee Robert Forbes is next. Deborah Campbell, News 13. News 13 continues with Close Up, Working Girls, next. <laughs> if I were a rich man... My name is Herschel Bernardi, reminding you that this is your last chance to see the best production of the best musical in the world, Fiddler on the Roof. I hate to say this, but if you miss this production of Fiddler, you'll never forgive yourself. And worse, you know your children will never forgive you? Think about that. 
Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see Fiddler on the Roof, now appearing through October 25th at the Aladdin Theater. Charge your tickets at 736-1738 or 798-5808. The independent one, Las Vegas one. Now to Las Vegas Sun subscribers only, free classified ads whenever you want for whatever you want to sell for $50 or less. Your free three-line classified private party ad will run for seven days, and you may place as many free ads as you want, as long as you're a Sun subscriber and the item selling for $50 or less. Call 383-7100 now and say you want a free Sunshine Saver special, and the Sun does the rest. Remember, free private party classified ads for Sun subscribers only, because we think you're special. Gotta move them out, gotta move those Chevys. Gotta get them out, gotta get them out now. If you want to save, now's the time to go get them. Get a great deal on a Chevrolet. Fairways moving out, 108 brand new 1982 Cavaliers, all of them discounted hundreds of dollars. And if we sell them all this month, I get to take off this Cavalier costume. So buy them now, please. Gotta move them out, gotta move those Chevys. Gotta get them out, gotta get them out now. If you want to save, now's the time to go get them. Get a great deal on a Chevrolet. Take a walk down the Strip or downtown at night, and it's almost impossible not to notice the working girls. They're also called prostitutes and hookers. Metro, city, and county officials call their presence a problem. For some girls, life is tough. For others, it's a bit easier. On this week's Close Up, you'll meet two women who make their living as working girls. You're gonna ask, Linda. Well, if you could, you, could, you, could you put on a show? Let's go. You could, oh, you could, you could, Larry. They come from all over. They're different types, ages, sizes, but they all do the same thing. Get paid for pleasure. Whether it be sex or companionship, it adds up to being paid to spend time with a stranger. Depending on how you manage it, a prostitute can make a lot of money in a short time with very little effort. But for others, it's different. In this report, you'll meet two women. Flower walks the streets. She used to work on the strip, but now she's downtown. And Teresa works out of the hotels through a bellman. Flower says she ran out of choices when she started. Uh, she had an education, costume, worked straight what, what jobs, but for medical reasons couldn't work. keep them. And she needed the money. To feed my kids, support me and my two kids. For yeah, Teresa, it was a matter of choice. For when she started, she was too young to but hold between, down a casino job that paid jobs. well. So she got into this line of work times, for the money. Right? She right. works through a bellman and, and pays uh, for security. I made fantastic money, so I kept going. Uh, it didn't mess with my head. I didn't get hard. I didn't get cold. I was the same person. Teresa says she couldn't live the way she wanted to on a straight okay. job. Flower so works alone. She says it was cold and but scary at first on the streets, jobs. and the girls out there were cold uh, and hard. Be very alert, very attentive. You watch other people. If you're not a fool, yeah, you got to have common sense. Just as Flower learned to deal with the street life, Teresa found her so way to the home, bellman, who could so arrange her clients says, for her. She's put on a list, so checks in regularly, and gets a call well, to go, go to her room. To room, you know, and I'll be up there, and I'll take care of business. I'll call him and say, please send me a bucket of ice, or something like that, which means I'm done and I'm coming down. Meet me in the back, and I'll give you your 40%, and then I'll leave. I'll go then Teresa waits for the next call to come. She makes at least $100 okay. per 45-minute session. As for Flower, it's a bit different. The minimum is $20 for oral sex. Tomorrow night, part two continues with life from a working girl's view. Jackie Glass, News 13. The administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration told members of the Air Traffic Control Association today that things are going quite well without the services of the controllers who went on strike two and a half months ago. In many areas, J. Lynn Helms says things are better than ever. Mark May reports. FAA Administrator J. Lynn Helms was presented a medallion by the Air Traffic Control Association today for the 9,000 men and women who have worked in the nation's control towers since the August 3rd strike by PATCO. Helms told members of the association meeting here in Las Vegas the system is working well and the skies are safe. Well, first, there's absolutely no question in my mind the airways are safe. I fly them routinely during the week. I fly them routinely on the weekend. 
secondly, I have three different groups that I asked to send me in inputs, and none of them have identified anything was unsafe. Even the NTSB report did not identify anything that's unsafe. So there's no question in my mind about the safety. But Helms admitted that both commercial and general aviation will have to operate at a reduced capacity, about 78% of normal. He says it will take about two to three years to rebuild the system by hiring more air traffic controllers. 8,000 will complete training by the end of this year, 4,000 more in 1982. That would give the nation 12,000 controllers. That's down from 16,000 before the strike. Helm says that goes to show that we originally had too many. When asked if the controllers would regain their jobs, Helms delivered an abrupt no. I acknowledged on, I think it was August the 6th, that the strike was over. We now have a very severe staff shortage that we're trying to fill. We're rebuilding the system. So there is no strike as far as we're concerned. Helms noted one positive effect of the strike. The FAA will save $200 million in salaries over the next two to three years. Mark May, News 13. Well, of course, the big sports news tonight is Game 1 World Series. The World Series, coast to coast, the Dodgers and the Yankees started out very bad for West Coast fans. What a turn of events. Last night, the Dodgers were on top of the world after Monday's ninth inning home run won the National League pennant for them. But with hardly a minute to catch their breath, the Dodgers tonight find themselves in a deep hole. That doesn't mean they can, cannot come back for a third time. A win tomorrow night makes the series a toss-up. But tonight, it was all over in the first inning. When Bob Watson homered with two on, here's the pictures of tonight's game from New York. One of the greatest Yankees of them all threw out the first ball. Joe DiMaggio had the honor, and for a while it seemed the current Yankees were inspired by the Clippers' presence. Bob Watson hit a three-run homer in the first inning, following a single by Jerry Mumphrey and a double by Lou Pinella. New York led three to nothing. They added another run in the third, Pinella driving in Mumphrey with this single. And they added still another in the fourth inning when Bob Castillo walked four men. The Dodgers got their first run in the fifth inning when Steve Yeager touched Ron Guidry for a home run to right to make it five to one. Guidry was replaced by Ron Davis in the eighth. Davis walked the first two men he faced and Goose Gossage came in in time to permit Jay Johnstone a single that scored Darrell Thomas to make it five to two. Greg Nettles squashed the Dodgers when he dove for Steve Garvey's hard smash down the line. Gossage retired the Dodgers in order in the ninth to preserve a Yankee 5-3 win and give the New Yorkers the first game of the 1981 World Series. This is Bud Fotopoulos reporting. Tomorrow in New York, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, our time, right here on Channel 13, Game 2 of the World Series. Former Dodger Tommy John on the mound for the Yankees and Burt Hooten, the Dodgers' best pitcher over the past month, will be starting for L.A. The New York Mets have a new manager tonight, and as expected, it's former Milwaukee Brewer manager George Bamberger. Well, it was a challenge, really. You know, like I said, I've been competitive for, you know, 35 years in baseball, and I enjoyed relaxing. Don't get me wrong, I enjoyed that being home. But this job come up, Frank, you know, I know Frank from uh, years before, uh, and let's be honest, the money's right. New York Mets, uh, New York number one city, you know, in the world. And uh, it was just a challenge. I got family on Staten Island, so there was quite a few things that entered into it. It was a tough decision, believe me. And it was many times I was 95% sure I wasn't going to take it. And then the last minute I got to be 50-50. Should I, shouldn't I? <laughs> and finally you have to say, the heck with it, I'm going to make a decision and make it right now. And that's what it amounted to. One L.A. team was able to win back in New York tonight, and the Nittany Lions have finally risen to the top. Those stories, more sports after this break. Greatest moments of the L.A. Rams, brought to you by the California Hotel. Miami, October 1976. With an incredible aerial attack, James Harris threw for 426 yards. One touchdown went to Ron Jesse, while another bomb found its way to Harold Jackson. But it was Tom Dempsey's 19-yard field goal that clinched this 31-28 come-from-behind victory over the Dolphins. California, here we come! The California Hotel and Casino, downtown. Your best bet in Las Vegas. Your best bet for comfort and convenience. Free valet parking. The spacious sparkle of our delightfully decorated rooms. Your best bet for fun and friendliness. Free bingo. The cavalier courtesy of owners who personally greet and gratify you. Sam Boyd's California Hotel and Casino. Your best bet! 
Why are more and more Las Vegas business people making the big switch to the Sharp any paper copiers from Nevada Copy Systems? The Sharp copies are really better than the originals, and the total package costs less. Nevada Copy Systems is the only factory authorized Sharp copier company in Las Vegas. I would recommend both Nevada Copy Systems and the Sharp copier. They're simply the best. Get all the facts and figures from Nevada Copy Systems. Simply dial 382-COPY. You'll save money. Diamond's Carnival Day sale starts early at 9 a.m. on Thursday, October 22nd, with 25% savings on Junior OP activewear for a sportier look. The best magic act in the kitchen is the amazing Cuisinart food processor. On sale now for only $89.99 at Diamond's Carnival Day sale. On and off the links, Arnold Palmer sweaters have really helped my fashion handicap, and now they're on sale for just $23.99 at Diamond's Carnival Day sale. Starting Thursday, October 22nd at 9 a.m. Come see us. Who do you know in real estate that can advance you the down payment for a new home before your old one sells? ERA! <laughs> Who's got the plan to help you avoid double house payments? ERA! Which real estate company is willing to buy your home if they can't sell it? ERA. Make your out-of-town move worry-free. Call your participating ERA real estate specialist to see if you qualify for the seller's security plan. It's another reason we're selling houses. Lots of families worry about money, but not us, because we're not alone. We belong to a credit union, and we use it. My paycheck goes straight in. It's like keeping the money in the family, because the members own the credit union. And credit unions aren't out to make a profit. That's why I got a low rate on my car loan. That's why I get high interest on my savings. We're a strong family, and we're part of one that's even stronger. Join the growing number of Nevadans who benefit from credit unions. Colorado State head football coach Sark Arslanian was fired tonight and replaced temporarily by defensive coordinator Chester Caddis. The Rams are winless in six games so far this season. Penn State is ranked number one in the nation for the first time since 1978, and Joe Paterno says this is his best team ever. Attrition got the Nitt Nittany Lions at the top. The polls also agree on the second and third ranked teams, Pittsburgh and North Carolina. The AP then ranks Clemson fourth and Southern Cal fifth, while UPI, the coaches, reverse that order. AP's second five looks like this, Iowa, Georgia, SMU, Mississippi State, and Texas, while UPI rates Georgia sixth, followed by Iowa, Texas, Alabama, and Mississippi State. BYU is 13th this week on AP, 15th on UPI. Saturday night over at the Silver Bowl, the UNLV football team will host the University of Utah Quarterback Sam King is today nursing a sore shoulder, and wide receiver Jim Sandusky has a bad right hand, but both are expected to play Saturday night. Marcel Dion and John Paul Kelly each scored three goals for the Los Angeles Kings tonight in a 9-6 victory over the Islanders back in Uniondale. This 22nd hat trick of Dion's career is the Isles' first loss of the season. The Kings are 3-3, three three, but Edmonton remains on top of the Smythe division. The Oilers 5, the Flames 4, one goal for Gretzky tonight. The Penguins dusted off Colorado 5 Five to three, and the Bruins extended their unbeaten streak to six games with a 4-3 win in St. Louis. Again, we're on tomorrow early because uh, we're not on early at all. Tomorrow, right. Because the baseball game at 5 o'clock, game two. But we'll be back at 11. When News 13 continues, Eric Randall will be here. in a profession that dedicates itself to preserving life every day gives me a feeling of pride and satisfaction I wouldn't find in any other field. Even at work, I can continue my education to the benefit of myself as well as my patients. I know that at any stage of my life, my skills and knowledge are respected and appreciated. Medicine is more than a job to me. It's a way of life. I'm a nurse at Desert Springs Hospital. Time, do that has stood the test of time to become more precious, more beautiful, more valuable today than it was years ago. The estate and antique jewelry sale, now through November 7th at Nevada's most respected jewelers, MJ Christensen Jewelers since 1939, 856 East Sahara Avenue, the Meadows Mall, and the Fashion Show. On the surface, checking accounts all look pretty much the same. A checkbook, checks, and with most banks, a hefty service charge fee you have to pay each month, but not at Nevada National. 
Maintain a $200 minimum balance in checking and you can forget those monthly service charges altogether. No service charge checking at Nevada National. The best checking account for your money. More economical, easier to manage. Nevada National. Nevada's National Bank. Serving people better. Eric, you've got an interesting bumper sticker here, which I've seen, but maybe you want to show it. Something a little, uh, little bit to kill time here. Occasionally, uh, people are nice enough to, to send me stuff, and if it's possible, I use it on the air, and I want to hold this up here. If we can do this without realigning the cameras, it's pretty bright. It says, have you hugged your arrow? today and this is from Jessica Todd a, a lady or girl I'm not exactly sure and I want to thank her for it this was the and also thank the uh, two gentlemen who brought this by and uh, I hope I can find a place to put this All somewhere right. on my car sticking around somewhere and go driving down through town bearing my <laughs> and by the way I did hug my arrow today did you hug yours today uh, but, uh, I don't have one well okay I'll give you one right after we get done here nice weather in store right now in Las Vegas it's 60 Two degrees, the barometer stands at 30.05 and rising, humidity 26%, saturation, and the winds are light and variable. And since we weren't on earlier today, we'll have to talk about what happened earlier today. It was sunny out. Now let's talk about right now. It's dark out, still clear, skies clear across the entire southwest area. High pressure still over there, even though it's not on the map, it is swooping down around the southwestern United States, keeping our skies clear. Daytime, it's sunny out and temperatures are a little bit warmer. It's going to stay that way over the next few days. We saw our high temperatures still getting up there. Once again, 81 degrees today in Las Vegas. Overnight low did drop down to 52. Some other high temperatures today weren't bad either. 73 in San Diego got up to 83 in Los Angeles. They got up to about 96 degrees yesterday. The Santa Ana winds coming down on them. 62 in San Francisco, 73 in Reno with an overnight low of 27. 72 in Winnemucca with 24 overnight. 69 Elko with 21 overnight. Salt Lake City had 69 also high temperature 89 degrees today in Phoenix Arizona across the United States tomorrow not much happening again a nice day sunny skies over the west and the southern United States a little bit of snow though over the northern Rockies and some snow mixed in with rain over the northern and the central plains shower activity will continue into the southern uh, <coughs> excuse me southern Great Lakes area and into the uh, the interior portions of the New England states, no chance for rain, though, really, about uh, down around New York way. They should have a nice, dry second game of the World Series tomorrow. Like we said, otherwise, sunny skies across remaining sections south and west of the United States tomorrow. Our forecast, more sun for us. We're going to be looking once again at clear nights and sunny, warmer days right on through Thursday. The highs will be around 80 to 90 degrees, or lows in 50 to 60. The winds from the north, 10 to 20 miles per hour. Sunrise will be at 6.53. Sunset will be at 5.57. So, nice weather again. More sunny skies, more clear nights. Still cool, though, because no clouds, but it's not going to be too unbearable. And don't forget to hug your arrow today, okay? <laughs> right, I will. All right. That's our show for tonight. Have a pleasant evening. following is a Channel 13 editorial. If your belt gets too tight, you either lose weight or you get a bigger belt. In the case of the federal budget, there are no more bigger belt sizes. So Reagan, in his usual common sense style, has said, let's take the fat out. Now, nobody relishes going on a diet, but sometimes it becomes necessary for a person's good health. And the same holds true for the national economy. If we want a healthy economy, we've got to cut back on the many so-called goodies. Taking the fat out of the federal budget isn't going to be a piece of cake either. One small example is the federally funded Amtrak's dining car menu. Elaborate dinners have been discontinued in lieu of a less expensive fast food bill of fare. Some people complain that Americans are having to give up too much, but the reality is that we can't keep feeding off the federal budget. Like any major diet, once it's completed, you're sure glad you stuck with it. Once we struggle through taking the fat out of the budget, the present and the future are going to be a lot brighter, and we'll feel a lot better about ourselves as a nation. We would like to know your opinion. Write us at Channel 13, 3355 South Valley View, 89102. I'm Ed Reimers for Nevada Savings with a big message for every person who saves. Right now is the time to open your tax-free savings account and get it all at Nevada Savings. Come to Big Safe Friendly and earn up to $2,000 interest tax-free on insured savings. You'd have to earn this much on a taxable investment in order to equal our non-taxable rate. You can open your Nevada Savings tax-free savings account for as little as $500.
And here's more good news. When you qualify, your tax-free savings account lets you choose from three great checking plans that could save you up to hundreds of dollars. And remember, behind your Nevada Savings tax-free account stand the size and strength of one of the West's most respected financial institutions. Open your tax-free savings account at Nevada Savings today and get it all. Two million five hundred thousand tourists rode the Las Vegas transit system in 1980. This allowed 450,000 local senior citizens, handicapped and students, to ride the Las Vegas transit system for only 25 cents per ride. Tourism makes the money-saving commuter card available to all Las Vegans. Do it different tomorrow. Leave your car at home and go with Las Vegas Transit. KTNV-TV, Las Vegas. Passing the buck, bureaucratic bumbling and mounting red tape while Centralia, Pennsylvania burns. Tonight, in a special edition of Nightline, coming to you from northeastern Pennsylvania, we'll focus on an underground fire which is smothering a town because no one can decide who ought to pay for putting the fire out. It's a problem that's been building for almost 20 years. This is ABC News Nightline. Tonight, reporting from Wilkes-Barre, Stratton, Pennsylvania, Ted Koppel. Good evening. Once upon a time, more than a generation ago, a number of small mining companies closed down their operations under the eastern Pennsylvania village of Centralia, about 50 miles from here. They left behind a rabbit's warren of tunnels that had been cut in the search for the rich anthracite coal that abounds in this region. At some point or another, someone, no one remembers who, started a trash dump on top of a slag heap. And somehow, no one quite remembers when, the dump caught on fire and the fire spread down through the slag onto one of the abandoned tunnels where the coal itself caught fire. And gradually the fire smoldered through the tunnels, spreading and feeding on the coal. That roughly is how the story began. As George Strait reports, no one, however, seems to know how it will end. For the last 19 years, the fire has raged underground and ever so slowly moved toward Centralia. Five years ago, the steam and carbon dioxide vapors from the burning timbers and rock 200 feet below came close enough to threaten the lives of some of the people here. Now they threaten the life of the entire town. With autumn, the people of Centralia begin six months of living in almost constant fear. The cold wind that whips this mountaintop community forces people inside. With their doors shut and windows closed, it leaves no avenue of escape for the toxic fumes seeping up from the mine fire into their homes carbon monoxide, methane, gases which almost killed John Coddington as he slept in his bed and almost drove Christine Oakham to a nervous breakdown from worry about the safety of her small boys. They could check the house in the morning and it could be fine. And in the afternoon, they could have surges of gases in the home and it could be a death house. And the whole family could be, could be wiped out. And there is another problem, cave-ins. The fire is literally burning up the pillars of coal that support the surface of this town. Last Valentine's Day, Todd Dombrowski was playing in his backyard when all of a sudden the ground gave way. His cousin saved him. Last spring, incidents like that caused much of Centralia to see red. People adorned their homes with red ribbons to symbolize that they're being choked not only by the gases, but by bureaucratic red tape as well. Some even took to the streets to protest a decision by the Department of Mines in Washington not to put the fire out. At a special town meeting, the residents were told that there was no money to put it out because Centralia didn't meet the government's definition of a disaster area. There is money available in Washington, and it comes under the heading of disaster. We're telling you that we're sitting on an impending disaster. Does this not uh, carry any weight to whereby you might be able to, uh, to look for funds under that disaster program? Well, I, I think that we can look into that, but my understanding of the, of the, uh, of the disaster uh, funding, okay, is to provide monies in relief, okay, of disaster victims, okay? Yeah, right, victims, well, we, don't, we don't want a victim for we For 19 years, the people here have had to live with that kind of frustration. In that time, $3.7 million has been spent to poke holes into the fire, study it, pour water on it, but still it rages. And as yet, no one knows for sure just how big it is. 
except that it has now been established that the fire is within a few feet of the natural gas line running through the town. Currently, a new $850,000 study is being planned. In the meantime, the federal government is moving out the 28 families who live in the area of most danger, where the gases exist in highest concentration. The Bureau of Mines has bought their homes and given the families enough money to make up the difference in price for a new home. Christine Oakham is relieved that her boys are now safe, and John Coddington hopes to open a new gas station. But both say that the move has been bittersweet. Well, I, I, I'm not going to be here when they fill their displace town. Uh, it's going to be a sad, sentimental thing for me to come up and see them pull those this year place down. And I just wish that the government would do something finally to extinguish the mine fire once and for all, and to uh, get rid of the anguish and um, tension that uh, all the people are going through over there. I still find myself going into the children's rooms to check to see if they're all right, to see if they're breathing okay. I guess it's a force of habit <laughs> after... Uh, so many months of being in it in Centralia. Helen Womer lives in the danger zone and could leave, but won't. That we took this position because we they do not know where the fire is, and indeed it may well be one and a half miles away from us. And uh, no plan has come up uh, by the government uh, what they're going to do about it. So we are standing firm. We are not moving. Next month, these once neat frame houses will be demolished. And those who are left wonder if they will be next. Already the Catholic elementary school is closed down, and the cemeteries here rendered unusable because of the threat of cave-ins. Centralia sits on top of $400 million worth of coal, and it owns the mineral rights. But it may never get a chance to profit from them, because as each house is torn down, more of its tax base is lost. It is now to the point where the town could face bankruptcy as soon as next summer. With the onset of winter, the most immediate threat here is from the fumes. That's why medical officials have warned that all pregnant women should leave town. Long range, if a way cannot soon be found to extinguish the fire, then as it spreads, one by one, people will be forced from their homes, leaving the town to the fire and the coal underneath here to whomever has enough money to come in and dig it out. George Strait, ABC News, Centralia, Pennsylvania. When we return, we'll switch live to Centralia to talk to some of the people who live there.